some very interesting presentations on a variety of subjects like the dasha mahavidyas the dasha disha bhagavata dasha lakshanam dasha tattvam continuing in the same vein today we have two more scholarly presentations one on the 10 tamil idols in the bharatanatyam idiom and then we have in the kuchipudi idiom dashavidha daruvulu but before we commence i call upon the convener nritya chudamani swapna sundari ji to give her opening address namaskaram vanakkam a very good morning to all of you i am not here to uh, for a long lecture just to uh, say that there have been very important takeaways from the four demonstrations that we've seen the first two first two demonstrations i have already commented upon yesterday we had a very interesting uh, very contrasting styles of uh, approaching their subjects one from kathak and one from the discipline of shastriya and um, while one focused on abstraction and suggestion the other focused on specifically bringing out and illustrating the uh, point that the lecture undertook so there were two totally different approaches both from dancers at about the same stage in their career and for me as a senior dancer and i'm sure for all of us it is very interesting to see how uh, the same subject uh, approached from two different sub uh, perspectives can yield two completely different results both delightful but both very very different from each other so i think today also we are going to have uh, a variety what with uh, dr swarnamalya uh, ganeshan giving us uh, i'm i'm sure it's going to be a very informative uh, a uh, talk and uh, presentation followed by the exuberant kuchipudi presentation so we're uh, i I'm, i'll join you on the other side and welcome both of them and thank them for participating and the musicians too for participating accepting our invitation to participate in this natikala conference thank you today's first presentation is by dr swarnamalya ganesh dr swarnamalya ganesh is a well known sadir Bharatanatyam dancer, dance historian, choreographer and tutor. She is a soloist with over 25 years of experience. She combines research and performance to bring many stunning productions for audiences around the world. She holds a PhD in dance history from the University of Madras. Also a keen student of archaeology, Swarnamalya has learnt deciphering the Grantha and the Chola Tamil scripts. She is a disciple of Guru K J Sarasa and the Tiruvalluputtur Kalyani granddaughters and a few other hereditary artists. She is trained in music and is also trained in Karanas under Dr. Padma Subramaniam. Her performance series titled From the Attic is based on her research and reconstruction of various lost repertoires and embodied learnings. She is the director of Ranga Mandira School of Performing Arts and Research Academy which works at educating students in performing arts and also creating a platform for sustainable development for the hereditary artist communities apart from documenting and archiving them a visiting faculty to universities in India and abroad she is a Fulbright fellow to teach at the University of California Los Angeles Today Swarnamalya brings us a very interesting um, collection Sangam literature wonderful poems that have reached us in the form of systematic anthologies Pattu Paata the 10 Tamil idols a literature of the Sangam period comprising of 10 texts that speak of the Tamil country I invite Swarn Swarnamalya Ganesh to present her lecture demonstration Shri Gurubhyo Namaha 
I thank Shri Krishna Gana Sabha for providing fodder for the thinking mind in a performer and in the audience with the Natakala conference series. I have been coming as a student to this conference for over two decades. So I'm sure you understand my excitement to now stand behind this lectern. What is even more exciting, actually fulfilling for me, is that I have been given this opportunity by a dancer, scholar, researcher, whom I admire very, very much. Her thought process is something that I align my own with as a dancer of the next generation. I am deeply humbled by this opportunity to present under your convenership, and thank you, Swapna Sundariyaka. My thanks are also due to Dr. Anupama Kailash, a scholar, dancer, and disciple of Swapnaka, and who's come to become a good friend of mine over the last few months. I want to acknowledge the presence of my guru for Tamil epigraphy and history, Sri S. Ramachandran, sir. I hope he's here in the audience today. He promised to be. Whose mentorship and his seminal social sciences research and anthropological findings have been vital in shaping this paper that I'm about to present today. Enculturation through Patripatan. This conference title, The Power of Ten, investigates the power of those concepts that have a numerical value which aggregates to number 10. My own investigation of Patripatta, a literature of the Sangam period, dated between the first and the third century common era, comprising of 10 texts that speak of the Tamil country, its patronage to the arts and nature's bountifulness, reveals its primal power over culture production. As a practitioner and researcher, deeply invested in understanding the role of hereditary communities, oral transfers, subaltern voices in performing arts, I had two primary questions I sought answers for during this research. One was the role of women as performers and ritualists, more specifically, the bigotry in viewing women artists as both beautiful and baneful all at once by societies. Women known later as Devadasis or simply Dasis in Tamil society were essentialized as priestesses in religious spaces and ritualists and entertainers in semi-religious spaces. Their roles also extended to performance of music and dances. However, every period has also produced literature where these women have been marked as debaucheries of a society, placing their presence on values of moral judgment. Is there an answer one can attempt to this sanctimoniousness? The simplest answer would be, of course, to blame the colonial infusion of Victorian morality on the elitist Indian mind. While that theory is undeniable, what is the explanation for all the virali vidutudas, ulas, natakas that people of the Tamil country produced over many historic periods, where a dasi was always portrayed as abetting immorality by a man? How does Karnagi? get deified and Madhavi vilified by a society in whose cultural fabric both these archetypes have coexisted. The second question I implored to find answer for was why the compositions of music, dance, and literature produced within the culture of the Tamils often come under sharp scrutiny of uh, particularly the compositions of uh, later medieval periods and contemporary periods that come under sharp scrutiny for their erotic and licentious content in modern times. Do these compositions, most of which belonging to the later medieval and colonial periods, reflect the social fabrics of earlier societies at all? Or are they, as claimed by the purists, the perversion of the degenerate mind of later composers? <laughs> Let's go to the next slide. Patupata records the customs followed by people who lived in the Tamil country at that time. Land was divided into five regional regions, namely Kurunji, Mullai, Marudam, Neidal, and Palai. Collectively, these were known as Ayintinai, or the five Ayintinai lands. The people, their occupations, and socioeconomics determined also their worship modes, food, patronage, arts, culture, etc. The emergence of these organized societies brought with it markers of civilization, such as clothing, variety of food preparations, hospitality, advanced warfare and combat, marriage and social bonds through marriage, norms and rules of morality. 
Important advances in the sphere of art, literature, and music were also made. Although most texts from the Patipata make references to many of the tribal customs, such as earlier musical systems that prevailed, etc., they also prescribe to a newer order that was contemporary and was emerging, namely techniques that codified the grammar of literature and music at that time. Therefore, the Patipata texts form an important link between earlier tribal societies, their cultures, and the reassimilations of these within an emerging tribal feudal society. <laughs> Next slide, please. Now, these are the 10 texts. Patina Pale, Kurunji Pata, Nedinal Vade, Madurai Kanchi, Mullai Pata, Perumba Natrupade, Sirumba Natrupade, Purunar Atrupade, Malai Padakadam, and Thirumurugatrupade. <laughs> the next slide. Now I'll focus on uh, these two questions that I had raised earlier. Particularly the Maruda Tinai, the fields, and Nadal Tinai, sea coast, became the basis for feudal societies as one produced food grains through agriculture and the other brought international trade through sea routes, making space for trade and commerce. It is in this atmosphere that music and dance were nurtured as high art. As remnants of their own tribal values, each of the narratives in the Patipata do foreground the valorous king sung by the nomadic bards and dancing women, their uh, combat and war exploits, love and sex. The singing bards were called parners. The dancing and singing songstresses who were their companions were called viraliyar. Both these groups were semi-nomadic tribes. They, they moved from place to place, traveling through various regions seasonally, documenting through music and dance the deeds of the king, nobleman, or chieftain, his lineage, and also singing songs on love and other such human emotions. We identify the Parnar and Viraliyars as semi-nomadic because they moved around in groups, but only within a certain geographic area, perhaps within a kingdom or a few neighboring kingdoms. One can deduce this from the fact that if they were to sing songs on a king with intimate knowledge of his ancestry, they had to sing in the local language or mother tongue of the patron. They often described in detail the various social and cultural climates prevalent. Their songs also recorded the local traditions. To be able to have such knowledge of customs and languages, these bards had to belong to the region and also perhaps the race of these patrons too and traverse only within a limited boundary in a semi-nomadic fashion. They probably erected tents just outside the kingdom and sang the, the exploits of these kings and nobles from time to time. <laughs> Scholars are of the view that therefore Parnar and Viraliyar music and dance was highly multicultural in nature. It was also rustic and had a tribal quality to it. Songs would have been in many different languages, musically too highly eclectic in nature. Their music would have been transnational considering that the Tamil country during this time had the presence of the Greeks, Romans, Persians, and other West Asians, collectively called as Yavanas, foreign traders. The mention of Yavanas in many of the Patipata songs does prove this. The concept of Parnar and Viraliyar arts are being consciously, as well as through a process of evolution, consolidated into art compendiums or treatises and vocabularies, surely by the time of Patipata. These treatises sought the patronage of kings and nobles. Art that adhered to these newly set norms was traditional in the sense that it drew from the memory and remnants of the bardic traditions. It was indigenous in the sense that it spoke to the local customs, festivals, uh, deities, and faiths of the people of that time. It was cosmopolitan as its assimilations were embedded strains of transnational movement through trade and exchange. It was classical because it was consumed by the emerging civilizations, documented through rule books and oral traditions. It developed a taste in a discerning audience. Therefore, in many ways, this period keenly codifies the margi, deshi margi, or vetiyal poduviyal transmigration within tribal feudal Tamil societies. Next slide, please. Let's talk about Tunangai Kut. This is a thousand century BC, really, thousand BC uh, tribal dance form. 
one of the earliest that we find in any of the literatures, uh, including the Sangha poetry. And um, I'd like to take you through this very early tribal goddess and her cult. Mallar or Mallars were the Maruda Tinai Kudis or inhabitants. The term represents a warrior or valorous clan of people. Their presiding deity was Indra. The Mallars have an Indo-European origin. They might have spoken, therefore, a language like probably Upper Brahmsa or more generically Prakrit. The serving class within this race itself, but with more proto-astroloid characteristics, were called Parnars. The main occupation of the Parnar and his female companion Virali was, of course, to eulogize the Mallar leader, chronicling his exploits, socio-cultural scene, etc., through music and dance. Recent genetic research conducted has proved this racial theory beyond any doubt. In early tribal society, the clan's leader or Gana's leader was either a man or a woman, Ganapa being the male and Ganika being the female. This leader would do a savage-like dance that evoked a sense of valor, induced delirium in them, and took the dancer to a state of trance sometimes even intoxicated, induced by intoxication. Associated with competition, warfare, and martial combat qualities, this dance required very little training and was part of the profile of the Gana leader to perform and lead, joined by her clan members. The dancer is called Tunangai Selvi, and the dance Tunangai Kutu. The dancer warrior, or Ganika, is the one who bears the responsibility of the clan and is their protector. She is therefore also called Porunan, the one who bears Porusikardu. <laughs> Next uh, slide. No, no, I think we'll remain here. Now I'd like to uh, give you a small description of Tunangai Kutu. Uh, we have actually attempted to uh, visualize Tunangai Kutu, which has been extremely difficult because this is somewhere in the BC, we have very little uh, description, but this seems to be a logical point of origin, as, as we can see, and we just wanted to try our hands at it. Uh, I mean, it's almost sacrilegious that I would walk into a Krishnagana Sabha dais and try something like this with my traditional Bharatanatyam practice costume, but I'm going to try it nevertheless, because I think it's uh, my way of paying obeisance to this forgotten female goddess, whose link we can find only in perhaps Jeshta Devi, another uh, very early goddess, who has Ma Mota as Tunangai, as in this big bulged out stomach. And she is not a very uh, pretty sight to look at. She is um, a Budam, Tunangai and Budam as she is called. So she is ghastly, but she is nevertheless the leader. Um, so she is the Gana, Ganika or the Gana Talaibi. And the Nigandas of later period about the Tunangai Kutu, because there's very little uh, uh, material to work with for the Tunangai Kutu, but the Nigandas give a wonderful description of the dance, the Tunangai Kutu. It says, Mudakya Yirukai Pulapudai Otri, Tuvakya Nadanam Tunangai Agum. So, which means these two hands have to constantly keep coming back to the Vila uh, Elumb uh, or uh, Pulapudai, the sides which is also quite, I mean, stunningly similar to how we begin in Bharatanatyam or many other dance styles. So, I mean, that's a very long line to draw, but uh, I'm tempted to do that as well. So, I'm going to <clears throat> try doing this dance. It has no um, 